You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot talking with you this time about a job nobody else could handle. I've been telling you the story of two young men who went to Ecuador as missionaries, Jim Elliott and Pete Fleming, and a third man who was a buddy of Jim Elliott's when he was a college student was Ed McCauley. Let me tell you a little bit about Ed. When I think back to the students that I knew at Wheaton College, I would say that Ed would have been way down my list of prospective missionaries. I could not have imagined Ed McCauley being a missionary. We thought Ed was going to be President of the United States. He was very tall, very handsome, a football star, a track star. He was President of his class, six feet two, weighed 190. And when the Hearst newspapers in Ed's senior year in college sponsored a nationwide oratorical contest, there were 10,000 contestants, and Ed McCulley won the first place. Well, Ed was not exactly what we used to think of was one of the spiritual types. Do you know that kind of dichotomy where you think, well, these kids are the spiritual ones and those people are not? And somehow or other, we never thought of the football team as a spiritual crowd. But there was a time when Jim Elliott began to think that is an outrageous kind of distinction to make, and there's no reason in the world why football players shouldn't be just as spiritual as anybody else. And he befriended Ed and began to talk to him when they were still students about this business of missionary work. Nothing doing for Ed McCauley. He was headed for politics, and we knew that he would make a good one. He went to Marquette University, enrolled in law school, and began to study very hard with that ambition in mind. He took a job as a night clerk in a hotel, and one night Jim visited him there on that job where he was trying to get some studying done in the wee small hours of the morning. And Jim said to him, why don't you start reading the Bible? Well, it wasn't that Jim thought Ed didn't know the Bible. Ed grew up in a very strong Christian home and knew the Bible probably about as well as Jim did. But it was not as big a part of his life as it was of Jim's. And so Jim suggested that instead of spending all of his time there at the hotel desk, in his law books, he really ought to give time to the scriptures as well. And so, Ed McCulley wrote this letter to Jim in September of 1950. Since taking this job, things have happened. I've been spending my free time studying the Word. Each night, the Lord seemed to get hold of me a little more. Night before last, I was reading in Nehemiah. I finished the book and read it through again. Here was a man who left everything, as far as position was concerned, to go do a job nobody else could handle. And because he went, the whole remnant back in Jerusalem got right with the Lord. Obstacles and hindrances fell away, and a great work was done. Jim, I couldn't get away from it. The Lord was dealing with me. On the way home yesterday morning, I took a long walk and came to a decision which I know is of the Lord. In all honesty before the Lord, I say that no one or nothing beyond himself and the word has any bearing upon what I've decided to do. I have one desire now to live a life of reckless abandon for the Lord, putting all my energy and strength into it. Maybe he'll send me someplace where the name of Jesus Christ is unknown. Jim, I'm taking the Lord at his word, and I'm trusting him to prove his word. It's kind of like putting all your eggs in one basket, but we've already put our trust in him for salvation, so why not do it as far as our life is concerned? If there's nothing to this business of eternal life, we might as well lose everything in one crack and throw our present life away with our life hereafter. But if there is something to it, then everything else the Lord says must hold true likewise. Pray for me, Jim. Man, to think the Lord got hold of me just one day before I was to register for school. I've got my money put away and was all set to go. Today was registration day for my second year, so I went over to the school to let them know why I wouldn't be back. I really prayed, like the apostle asked the Ephesians to pray, that I might open my mouth boldly. I talked to all the fellows that I knew well. Then I went in to see a professor. 
I told him what I planned to do, and before I left, he had tears in his eyes. I went in to see another professor and talked to him. All I got was a cold farewell and a good luck wish. Well, that's it. Two days ago, I was a law student. Today, I'm an untitled nobody. Thanks, Jim, for the intercession on my behalf. Don't let up. And, brother, I'm really praying for you, too, as you're making preparation to leave. I only wish I were going with you. Well, you can imagine that Jim wished the same. But in the providence of God, these two men worked together as home missionaries. They went to a, a little town in southern Illinois called Cairo, spelled the same as Cairo, Egypt, and they began a radio program there called the March of Truth. And I can still hear their voices on that radio program with great earnestness and great certainty preaching the gospel. The results of their work in Cairo were not what anyone would call startling. But they began to learn to trust God. They began to realize that missionary life is not a life of glamour. Jim began to entertain the very fond hope that Ed McCulley would be the man who would go to Ecuador with him. They would be able to go two by two. But during that year, Ed McCulley met a young woman from Pontiac, Michigan, named Mary Lou Hobolth. He wrote to Mary Lou about two things that he had been praying definitely about. First, that the Lord will give us wisdom in our relationship, even in the business of letter writing. Second, that as long as we've got anything to do with each other, that each of us will be an influence upon the other for closer fellowship with the Lord. I don't mean that we'll be preaching to each other, but just that our attraction for each other will be a means of attracting us more to the Lord. I know that's the way you feel, too. Their friendship ripened very fast, and in April, Ed and Mary Lou became engaged. Wonderful news for Ed and Mary Lou, terrible news for Jim, because he had hoped for Ed's being single to go with him to Ecuador. On May 29, 1951, Ed McCulley wrote to Mary Lou Hobolth, One month from today you will have lost all your freedom and will be subject to my iron rule, my unflinching law, and my cruel command. You have exactly 31 days to reconsider. Do you think you'll really be able to put up with me for the rest of your life? It won't be easy. There will be plenty of times you'll wonder why on earth you married me. Have you reconsidered? Now let me tell you, that I love you with all of my heart. Mary Lou did not reconsider. They were married in June in her home church, the First Baptist of Pontiac, Michigan. It was not very long before they were in missionary medical school in Los Angeles, and in December of 1952, they sailed for Ecuador. They were still studying Spanish in Quito, in the same house where I had studied Spanish, the home of the Adiases, when they received a radio message one morning from Jim Elliott and Pete Fleming saying that the entire station on which they had been working, Shandia, had been completely wiped out by a flood. Can you come down? Well, that was Ed's call to the jungle. He told Mary Lou that he was going down to see if he could help out his buddies Jim and Ed. He went to Shandia, and the three men conferred together as to how they should plan their future work in the jungle. It seemed wise that they should make a reconnoitering trip through the southern part of the jungle where there were Quechuas who had never had a missionary. And so they took a trip down the Bobonasa River, and on that trip met a man by the name of Atanasio in a little place called Puyupungu. Atanasio had two wives and about 15 children, and he said that he would welcome a mission station there. He would even help to build it, and he would like the missionaries to put in a school so that his children could learn. An excerpt from Ed's diary tells of their first days in the rainforest after he and Mary Lou had moved from Quito to Shandia. We are settled in well by now. Life gets to be a routine of buying, selling, treating the sick, fixing kerosene and gasoline appliances, trying to learn a language. It's a fight to get time for the latter. Also time for Bible study and prayer. It's hard to stay on top of it all, hard to keep rejoicing, hard to love these ungrateful Indians. 
It's hard to keep our primary purpose in view when we get so swamped with secondary things. I wonder if I'm talking to anyone today that feels exactly the same. Somebody who's doing a job that looks like no job at all. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of sweat and a lot of trouble, and maybe it's endless and relentless. Maybe it's a mother's job. Maybe it's a job that you feel you'll never get any credit for. But you know, in God's story, I believe that the job you're doing is a job that nobody else could handle. Not right now. It's a job that God has given to you to do, and therefore it's a job that nobody else could handle. Are you thinking, what am I doing here? Why am I marking time in this place? Think of the man, Ed McCulley, who went from law school to an Indian-style house, from being a brilliant orator to being what the Kichwas thought was a bumbling idiot. He was willing to do that for Jesus Christ. From 1989, the Ed McCauley story, a job nobody else could handle.